Good evening. I'm John Scales, and tonight I'm speaking to the Milwaukee Civil War Roundtable. Now, the subject tonight will be, did Forrest make a difference? And I will discuss Nathan Bedford Forrest's military career and where he had an impact on the war. Now, this is all taken from my book, which is shown right here, the Battles and Campaigns of Confederate General Nathan Bedford Forrest, which came out almost exactly three years ago. This is the second edition, and you can get it from Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or Savas Beatty. Okay, well, thank you, and good to see you all here this evening. Uh, you know, I wrote this book that you'll see over there uh, about Forrest during the Civil War, and that's basically all I concentrated on, even though he's a very controversial character uh, before and after the Civil War, but I concentrated on the battles and campaigns. But one of the questions I keep getting asked is, okay, everybody knows he was very successful as a general, but so what? Because most of what he did was not in conjunction with the main armies. It was often some sideshow someplace. So what difference did he make in the war? So I thought that was a good question and I explore it in this presentation. Now, let's see if I can work the system. Okay, maybe you can read that and maybe you can't. <laughs> this is, if you're like me, you, you struggle sometimes. All right, I talk about his early life. He was born in Chapel Hill, Tennessee to a blacksmith and his wife. He, was, uh, he and his twin sister were the firstborn. Uh, he had less than six months of formal education. The family moved from the Chapel Hill area into northern Mississippi, uh, southeast of, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, southeast of Memphis is where it was. But his father promptly died right after that. And him being the oldest man now, at age 16, took responsibility for what was a very large family. In fact, his mother was still pregnant now with his youngest, uh, youngest brother. So, uh, he stayed and just basically raised the crops for the family until age 18, at which time his mother remarried, and so he was, he was released from that burden and went to work for his uncle, who ran a livery stable and sold horses. So he learned a little bit about horse trading early on. And that actually was his first real exposure uh, to slavery because his family had been very poor. But he was very successful. His, father, his uncle, rather, uh, was shot and killed over a debt dispute 
But uh, Forrest, as an 18-year-old, managed to drive off the three attackers and, and wounded them. Uh, he was wounded himself, but he managed to win that encounter single-handedly. And the reason is because he was, uh, for that age, uh, very formidable physically. He was 6'2", and over 200 pounds, and having worked in the fields his whole life, and that in that day and time, he was he was a very formidable adversary. Uh, he inherited the livery stable, and from that, he realized that being a slave trader was the way to get ahead. So that's what he did. He took up slave trading and was very successful at that. He moved to Memphis from uh, Hernando, Mississippi, which is where the livery stable was. He moved to Memphis and uh, became one of the wealthiest people in Tennessee. In fact, uh, after the war, the, uh, you could almost call it a prison, where he kept the slaves that he was waiting to, to save was in such good shape, it became a hotel. Uh, so he was successful there. He was elected alderman of Memphis twice. And he decided to get out of the slave trading business and bought plantations down on the Mississippi River in Mississippi. And uh, what he was trying to do is he was very much of a social climber. Having come from one of the poorest possible backgrounds, he was trying to get his ahead and get his family ahead. He made sure his younger brothers and sisters were uh, educated. Okay. So, as I say, before the war, he ended up being one of the richest people in that area of Tennessee. Now, in the first year of the war, he enlisted as a private in a company of cavalry. But you have to feel like the fix was in because the governor sent him a letter within a month saying, I'll make you a lieutenant colonel if you can raise a battalion of cavalry. Well, it didn't take him long, and he had a battalion of cavalry. He actually had eight cavalry companies. Uh, half of them from Alabama and the rest from Texas, Kentucky, and Tennessee. Uh, he patrolled, after some training, he patrolled up in Kentucky around the Hopkinsville area and north of there. Had his first uh, engagements in that area, first with a, a, uh, a, a tin clad riverboat, nobody heard on either side. But then he had an engagement with a, uh, a Union Cavalry Patrol in Sacramento, uh, Kentucky, and he won that engagement very decisively. Uh, he uh, was then ordered to Fort Donaldson because Fort Henry had just been taken by General Grant. And he took charge of the cavalry at Fort Donaldson, and he credibly performed there at Donaldson, but... Of course, uh, the uh, Confederate hierarchy there was not successful. The three generals were sitting there and not able to make up their mind how they were going to do things and finally decided to surrender. He asked for and got permission to cut his way out, and he did. Made it to Nashville. Uh, he was promptly put in charge of evacuating military supplies from Nashville, and he did that. And then uh, he reported to Sidney Johnson, in Murfreesboro, was told, take 15 days leave, recruit some more men. He did that, rejoined the Army in northern Mississippi, and uh, soon thereafter, he became a full colonel because he now had a full regiment and went to Shiloh. Uh, he he uh, had some contact at Shiloh, and uh, both, both uh, with regards to the hornet's nest, and uh, that night was scouting. The second day, though, his cavalry was dispersed to uh, basically be a, staggler, a straggler patrol behind the uh, battlefield. Uh, on the third day, probably hadn't heard of the third day of Shiloh, have you? Uh, the third day, the Confederates were all retreating. The reserve corps to which he was attached was the rear guard. Uh, Sherman had two brigades of infantry pursuing with. That afternoon, uh, he came upon a Confederate hospital, and so he put, his, uh, put a regiment of infantry in 
uh, in line out in front, backed him up with a battalion of cavalry, and advanced forward with everybody else in column. Uh, it had rained a lot the night before, and when the infantry got down to this little wet weather creek, they lost their formation. Uh, no infantryman likes to get his, uh, his shoes and socks wet, so uh, that's probably what happened. Forrest was actually hidden behind the hospital up there with 300 cavalrymen. He saw them fall into disarray. He charged. The infantry panicked, ran. It panicked the battalion of cavalry. And guess who was next? Sherman and his staff. After the war, Sherman made the comment that uh, if Forrest hadn't fired all the rounds in his revolver, his war would have ended right there. That was the only time they ever actually met on the field of battle. But he was severely wounded in that battle. Uh, so, at any rate, when he returned from convalescence, he was identified for promotion to Brigadier General. And there's a particular reason for that. Well, let me go back to the situation here. All right, you can see here, let's see if we can get this thing to come up there. Well, having trouble making it show. Nope. That wasn't right. So anyway, all right, well, I was going to use a pointer, but that's all right. You can see the situation, and this by now is July of 62, or actually June of 62 at this time. Uh, Halleck gathered all his forces and forced Beauregard out of Corinth, south to Tupelo, Mississippi. All right, but then Halleck was called to Washington to take overall charge of the armies. So he divided that army into two. He gave half to Grant and said, all right, Grant, you've got Mississippi. Ultimate objective is Vicksburg. At Buell, you are going to liberate North Alabama and move all the way over to East Tennessee and take Chattanooga. However, on the way, you need to repair the Memphis and Charleston Railroad, which went across North Alabama to Chattanooga. All right. Beauregard, meanwhile, gets relieved by Davis and replaced by Bragg. So Bragg's sitting at, at Tupelo. Buell is moving his forces toward Chattanooga. And uh, Edmund Kirby Smith is trying to defend East Tennessee, but he only has 10,000 people. And Buell has well over 40,000 people coming his way. And oh, by the way, Kirby Smith has to defend both Chattanooga and Knoxville, and there's a thrust coming through the Cumberland Gap up there towards, uh, uh, towards Knoxville. So, that's the overall situation. Chattanooga had several cavalry regiments. But, as all too often happened in the Civil War, each colonel was squabbling with the other colonels of cavalry saying, no, I'm senior and I should be in charge of everybody. So no one was in charge of anybody and the efficiency level was very low. So that's why they needed a Brigadier General of Cavalry and they sent for Forrest over in Mississippi. He had to leave the unit he had he'd put together and join them, uh, join these uh, regiments of cavalry in the Chattanooga area. So he organized them. Meanwhile, Grant is reluctant to move towards Vicksburg at this time. Why? Because it's midsummer. And most of his people, most of his soldiers are from the Midwest. That's malaria season. So he was very reluctant to move forward, and he was trying to just hold on to what he had in northern Mississippi. Bragg looked at that and realized Grant is going to stay basically his for a while. And I'm going to get Van Dorn over here from uh, Arkansas. And so Bragg said, you know, I need to go to Chattanooga. Join Kirby Smith, and we can defeat Buell and save Chattanooga, which was a very important rail junction. So, Forrest, yeah, he's identified from Brigadier General, but he wasn't yet uh, confirmed, so they still called him Colonel. 
Kirby Smith said, Colonel Forrest will take three regiments of cavalry, go into Middle Tennessee, and delay the movement of 40-odd thousand soldiers toward Chattanooga until Bragg can get there. But Bragg's got to go from Tupelo, Mississippi, to Mobile, Alabama, to Montgomery, Alabama, he's using the railroads, Atlanta, Georgia, to Chattanooga. The estimate was a month. So Forrest is asked to delay with his less than 2,000 people, he had about 1,500 people, delay an army of over 40,000 that's coming his way. Luckily, Buell was bogged down in the logistics, trying to repair the railroads, and, uh, but he was moving there, and in fact, one of his units had actually bombarded Chattanooga. So what happened? Forrest skirts Buell's forces to the east across the Cumberland Plateau, very rugged ground, and hits Murfreesboro behind Buell's lines, a supply depot, and part of the Nashville to Chattanooga Railroad. Now, there's a garrison there that is almost the same size as the number of people he has, but it is a very uh, a Confederate sympathizing town, so he has some information. And of course, the Confederate Army wasn't the only army that had troubles between colonels not agreeing with each other. So the Union Army had two regiments of infantry in different camps, separated by a couple of miles. Forrest was able to hit them in the pre-dawn hours, and he defeated one and had, got them to surrender. The, uh, those were uh, Michigan, Ninth Michigan. The uh, 3rd Minnesota was the other bunch, and they had a battery of artillery. But the colonel in charge uh, was very uncertain of himself and did not advance. So Forrest, you would think, well, I've been real successful. I've gotten these guys to surrender. I've actually freed some prisoners. Maybe I should leave. But Forrest said, no, I mean to have them all. So he sent a courier to the Colonel Lester and said, you need to surrender. And Lester said, well, I want to talk to the other colonel. So Forrest let him come there in a flag of truce, and even though Forrest only had about 1,500 people, somehow Lester saw a few more people than that during his ride over there and decided to surrender. So that was the bottom line. 100 Union killed and wounded, 1,200 prisoners, four guns, 50 wagons. Forrest lost less than 100 men. Okay, that's a nice blow. But what was really important, although Murfreesboro is over there on the left side of the map, what he did was he only retreated a short ways over to McMinnville, took several days to rest his horses because it had a rough crossing to get there, and then raided all the way to the outskirts of Nashville, burned three railroad bridges and Antioch Station, killed 10 Union soldiers, wounded, uh, over a dozen, captured almost a hundred, no casualties. There was an entire infantry division wandering all around there looking for him, and of course being mounted, he was able to dodge them, and he made it back. So not only did he make his presence known, he stayed. In fact, he stayed there until early September. Now, the raid depicted here was uh, unsuccessful. He lost some casualties there because he didn't understand how hard one of those blockhouses is to take without artillery. He had sent his, <coughs> excuse me, he had, he had sent his artillery back to Chattanooga, so, or the artillery that he had captured. So anyway, uh, he lost a bunch of people, my estimate 75, but at any rate, he stayed back there Buell's advance had totally stopped as he was trying to keep the railroad working, and what he was doing was sending patrols all over the place looking for Forrest. Now, you see in the lower right, there's a big red arrow 
moving northeast. Months. And that's Bragg coming up the Sequatchie Valley on the way to invade Kentucky, which of course flipped the entire situation in that area. So, before this raid, Buell was within 30 miles of Chattanooga with superior forces ready to take Chattanooga. The only forces that could really oppose him were basically two states away. But because Buell stopped to deal with the threat to his communications, Chattanooga did not fall for another year. It was Buell's replacement, Rosecrans, that took Chattanooga in September of 1863. Now, a lot of people have a diff differing opinions about the Civil War, but I'll tell you, my opinion is that the Western theater was the decisive theater. If you look at what happened in Virginia, with very few exceptions, nothing ha everything happened within a 100-mile radius. There weren't big movements. Out west is where things were decided. And so I would maintain, to a very great extent, but between Buell's being careful and Forrest's raid, that made a, almost a year difference in the Western theater, the decisive theater. Okay, well, he goes with uh, Bragg to, uh, to uh, Kentucky, and he goes to, uh, before Perryville, his cavalry is parceled out and penny packets all over. And he's very frustrated. And finally, Bragg just turns to him and says, okay, you go back to the Murfreesboro area. We're recruiting more soldiers there. Recruit yourself a new brigade and set them up. So that's what he did. By December, he had a partially equipped brigade, 2,000 men, and he was posted on Bragg's left flank way over in Columbia. This is Columbia, Tennessee, which is a, uh, a pretty good distance. Let's try to think, think about 60 miles from Murfreesboro, where Bragg was himself. So, so he's on the left flank to the west. Now, however, now the situation is overall different. We have Bragg in Chattanooga or rather in Murfreesboro. Rosecrans now is taken over from Buell. He's in Nashville. But now it's wintertime, it's December, and Grant is on the move. He's moving south along the Mississippi Central. His supply line heads due north to Columbus, Kentucky, and the Mississippi River there. That railroad is his supply line. He's protecting it with 10,000 soldiers. Pemberton is trying to hold Mississippi, but he's grossly outnumbered, and he's screaming for help. So, Bragg told Forrest, I got a mission for you. Forrest said, hey, I don't even have tack for some of my horses. I don't have any percussion caps. My people aren't trained. Bragg says, don't care. Bragg directed him, and there it is, cross rapidly into West Tennessee, cross the Tennessee River, which is a formidable river in, in December. Oh, by the way, patrolled by Union gunboats. Uh, fall on Grant's communications. And take care of them, destroy the railroad. With the idea that this will frustrate Grant's advance down the railroad into Mississippi. So, Forrest crosses the Tennessee River, has a series of engagements. Uh, the, 
the local commander there, uh, the Union commander, pulls all of his 10,000 people in to protect Jackson, Mississippi, which is the major city along that railroad. Uh, and because he thinks, because of some bluffing that's going on by Forrest, that there's a couple of infantry divisions and cavalry. Uh, the guy's name was Sullivan. Uh, anyway, uh, so Forrest gets him kind of cooped up, trying to defend himself, and attacking uh, trestles all along the railroad. Now, most of the trestles were very minor and easily repaired, but there's one near the top. You can see that, or I guess about two-thirds of the way up. You see O'Bion River. There was a seven-mile causeway, railroad causeway, over that river. He burned that, and it was months before that could be restored. So, it's basically, call it unrepairable. Then he started back, and by this time Sullivan had figured out, hey, it's just cavalry. So he sent two infantry brigades after him, and uh, the, the two didn't work together that well, and so he, they, they were separate from each other. He attacked one and uh, was very successful, but the other one came up behind him. So uh, he, he had to abandon his battle and run and cross the Tennessee River back in the, in the middle of Tennessee. So anyway, he lost 400 men performing this mission, 300 of them as prisoners. But he captured 1,300, uh, well, he captured 1,000 of the total of 1,300 casualties he inflicted during that time. And as I say, the railway, Grant's main supply line, was breached and unrepairable as far as this campaign went. So in Grant's memoirs, well, simultaneously Van Dorn hit the Holly Springs Depot, which is where Grant had stockpiled some supplies. So in Grant's memoirs, he said that at the same time as Van Dorn's raid, Forrest got on, got on the railroad lines, cut off all, commu all communications for a week, demonstrated the impossibility of maintaining a, a line of road over that distance in a hostile territory. Therefore, he abandoned his campaign into Mississippi, went back to Memphis, rethought the whole thing. Vicksburg did not fall for, for, uh, for six months, until six months after that, which means because there was no way Pemberton was, gonna, was going to hold with the forces he had on hand there. As Bragg didn't, wasn't detaching anything. Meanwhile, at the same time, he was fighting the Battle of Stones River. So uh, you can make the argument that, again, Forrest delayed and extended the tur duration of the war by this raid. Uh, 1863, he fought under Wheeler, with Wheeler, fought under Van Dorn, with Van Dorn, of course, Van Dorn didn't last long. He was shot and killed by a jealous husband. So, uh, and he, he ended up, uh, Forrest ended up taking over that particular, uh, that particular unit. Uh, he protected Bragg's left flank uh, in the Tullahoma campaign, but of course, the Union Army went to Bragg's right flank and uh, winkled him out of all those Tennessee positions without any kind of major battle. Uh, but that eventually led to the fall of Chattanooga and the Battle of Chickamauga. Uh, Forrest was present for three days of Chickamauga. Uh, he actually missed an opportunity. Uh, the Horseshoe Ridge at the vital moment was reinforced by Steedman's division. Uh, Forrest tried to delay them, but his men were fought out. They, they fought for three days because there was preliminary battle before the two main days of, of, of Chickamauga and he could not stop them. Of course, he had no idea what was happening on the other end of the battlefield, but had he been able to delay that Stevens division by 20 minutes, uh, Forrest was actually hidden behind the hospital up there with 300 cavalrymen. He saw them fall into disarray. He charged. The infantry panicked, ran. It panicked the battalion of cavalry, and guess who was next? Sherman and his staff. After the war, Sherman made the comment, 
that uh, if Forrest hadn't fired all the rounds in his revolver, his war would have ended right there. That was the only time they ever actually met on the field of battle. But he was severely wounded in that battle. Uh, so, at any rate, when he returned from convalescence, he was identified for promotion to Brigadier General. And there's a particular reason for that. Well, let me go back to the situation here. All right, you can see here, let's see if we can get this thing to come up there. Well, having trouble making it show. Nope. That wasn't right. So anyway, all right, well, I was going to use a pointer, but that's all right. You can see the situation, and this by now is July of 62, or actually June of 62 at this time. Uh, Halleck gathered all his forces and forced Beauregard out of Corinth, south to Tupelo, Mississippi. All right, but then Halleck was called to Washington to take over all charge of the armies. So he divided that army into two. He gave half to Grant and said, all right, Grant, you've got Mississippi. Ultimate objective is Vicksburg. Uh, Buell, you are going to liberate North Alabama and move all the way over to East Tennessee and take Chattanooga. However, on the way, you need to repair the Memphis and Charleston Railroad, which went across North Alabama to Chattanooga. All right. Beauregard, meanwhile, gets relieved by Davis and replaced by Bragg. So Bragg's sitting at, at Tupelo. Buell is moving his forces toward Chattanooga. And uh, Edmund Kirby Smith is trying to defend East Tennessee, but he only has 10,000 people. And Buell has well over 40,000 people coming his way. And oh, by the way, Kirby Smith has to defend both Chattanooga and Knoxville, and there's a thrust coming through the Cumberland Gap up there towards, uh, uh, towards Knoxville. So, that's the overall situation. Chattanooga had several cavalry regiments. But, as all too often happened in the Civil War, each colonel was squabbling with the other colonels of cavalry saying, no, I'm senior and I should be in charge of everybody. So no one was in charge of anybody and the efficiency level was very low. So that's why they needed a Brigadier General of Cavalry and they sent for Forrest over in Mississippi. He had to leave the unit he had he'd put together and join them, uh, join these uh, regiments of cavalry in the Chattanooga area. So he organized them. Meanwhile, Grant is reluctant to move towards Vicksburg at this time. Why? Because it's midsummer. And most of his people, most of his soldiers are from the Midwest. That's malaria season. So he was very reluctant to move forward, and he was trying to just hold on to what he had in northern Mississippi. Bragg looked at that and realized Grant is going to stay basically is for a while. And I'm going to get Van Dorn over here from uh, Arkansas. And so Bragg said, you know, I need to go to Chattanooga. Join Kirby Smith, and we can defeat Buell and save Chattanooga, which was a very important rail junction. So, Forrest, yeah, he's identified from Brigadier General, but he wasn't yet uh, confirmed, so they still called him Colonel. Kirby Smith said, Colonel Forrest will take three regiments of cavalry, go into Middle Tennessee, and delay the movement of 40-odd thousand soldiers toward Chattanooga until Bragg can get there. But Bragg's got to go from Tupelo, Mississippi, to Mobile, Alabama, to Montgomery, Alabama, he's using the railroads, Atlanta, Georgia, to Chattanooga. The estimate was a month. So Forrest is asked to delay with his less than 2,000 people, he had about 1,500 people, delay an army of over 40,000 that's coming his way. 
Luckily, Buell was bogged down in the logistics, trying to repair the railroads, and, uh, but he was moving there, and in fact, one of his units had actually bombarded Chattanooga. So what happened? Forrest skirts Buell's forces to the east across the Cumberland Plateau, very rugged ground, and hits Murfreesboro behind Buell's lines, a supply depot, and part of the Nashville to Chattanooga Railroad. Now, there's a garrison there that is almost the same size as the number of people he has, but it is a very uh, a Confederate sympathizing town, so he has some information. And of course, the Confederate Army wasn't the only army that had troubles between colonels not agreeing with each other. So the Union Army had two regiments of infantry and different camps, separated by a couple of miles. Forrest was able to hit them in the pre-dawn hours, and he defeated one and ha got them to surrender. The, uh, those were uh, Michigan, 9th Michigan. The uh, 3rd Minnesota was the other bunch, and they had a battery of artillery. But the colonel in charge uh, was very uncertain of himself and did not advance. So Forrest, you would think, well, I've been real successful. I've gotten these guys to surrender. I've actually freed some prisoners. Maybe I should leave. But Forrest said, no, I mean to have them all. So he sent a courier to the Colonel Lester and said, you need to surrender. And Lester said, well, I want to talk to the other colonel. So Forrest let him come there in a flag of truce, and even though Forrest only had about 1,500 people, somehow Lester saw a few more people than that during his ride over there and decided to surrender. So that was the bottom line. 100 Union killed and wounded, 1,200 prisoners, four guns, 50 wagons. Forrest lost less than 100 men. Okay, that's a nice blow. But what was really important, although Murfreesboro is over there on the left side of the map, what he did was he only retreated a short ways over to McMinnville, took several days to rest his horses because it had a rough crossing to get there, and then raided all the way to the outskirts of Nashville, burned three railroad bridges and Antioch Station, killed 10 Union soldiers, wounded, uh, over a dozen, captured almost a hundred, no casualties. There was an entire infantry division wandering all around there looking for him, and of course being mounted, he was able to dodge them, and he made it back. So not only did he make his presence known, he stayed. In fact, he stayed there until early September. Now, the raid depicted here was uh, unsuccessful. He lost some casualties there because he didn't understand how hard one of those blockhouses is to take without artillery. He had sent his, <coughs> excuse me, he had, he had sent his artillery back to Chattanooga, so, or the artillery that he'd captured. So anyway, uh, he lost a bunch of people, my estimate 75, but at any rate, he stayed back there Buell's advance had totally stopped as he was trying to keep the railroad working, and what he was doing was sending patrols all over the place looking for Forrest. Now, how many people here were uh, in the military? I didn't see it because I was up front. Have you ever heard of an IG inspection? Richmond sent an IG inspector to Forrest on the 1st of May, and he stayed there inspecting all the horses, the people, and everybody for the entire month of May. So while Joe Johnson was being driven out of North Georgia, an effective counter to his, his, his attack was undergoing an IG inspection. And meanwhile, Sherman, of course, was well aware of this problem, so he had been organizing forces in Memphis to send against 
uh, forest. Uh, the first one ended up uh, at Bryce's Crossroads. Uh, over 8,000 people under Sam Sturgis, uh, infantry, cavalry, and artillery um, attacked Forrest, who had a little less than 5,000 people. But Forrest managed to uh, take advantage of their of Sturgis's issue. Basically, he let the cavalry get well in front of the infantry so Forrest could defeat them in detail, and that's what happened at Bryce's Crossroads. All right, uh, so Sturgis went running back. He lost, I think, 18 of his 22 artillery pieces and 1,500 prisoners, etc. cetera. Uh, so Sherman said, okay, well, I'm going to send A.J. Smith with a lot more people back after him. So they started coming down. Uh, they got as far as Harrisburg, which is the outskirts of Tupelo. Uh, Forrest was joined by S.D. Lee, who was his boss. And uh, Lee had tactical command of the battlefield. He, Lee was worried because there was a demonstration off Mobile at that time. And uh, said, I've got to attack because I've got to get all these troops back to, that, I, that I brought up here back to Mobile. And uh, the attack was a fiasco. It was not well coordinated. Uh, Forrest was actually ill at the time. He, he had, he had, he had uh, boils and couldn't sit in the saddle, so uh, he had a problem. Um, so he didn't have tactical command. But at any rate, there were very severe uh, Confederate losses. Not very many Union losses, but A.J. Smith decided that he'd go back uh, to wounded Forrest. He would go back in uh, Memphis. Sherman still wasn't satisfied, so he said, take more troops and, and, uh, and, and go back and, and beat Forrest. Well, by this time, Forrest had lost half his people to try to protect Alabama. There was no way he could stop A.J. Smith, but he did something very intelligent at a level. He split his forces in two. He left Chalmers with half his force, delaying A.J. Smith, who was moving very slowly because of his supply situation, took the other half, circled around to the west, and came into Memphis, where the big headquarters was, and raided Memphis in the pre-dawn hours. Tried to capture several generals. There were three generals there. Didn't capture any of them, but the guy in charge, a guy named Washburn, who had relieved Horlbut, uh, had to flee the hotel he was staying in in his nightshirt uh, to escape being captured. Uh, a funny story with that. Hurlbut had been relieved, but he was still in town. He was supposed to be in that same hotel, but he chose to spend the night elsewhere. Uh, but uh, Herbert made the, one of the best comments you'll ever hear about the Civil War. He said, well, they relieved me because I couldn't keep Forrest out of West Tennessee, but Washburn can't even keep him out of his own bedroom, which was a true statement and pretty funny. But anyway, that was August of 64. No more raids. Why? Because Sherman took Atlanta on the 2nd of September. He didn't need to worry about his supplies anymore because Hood, who replaced Jim Johnson, had dissipated much of the offensive striking power of his army. He wasn't worried about fighting big battles anymore. And now Forrest gets the green light. Go after Sherman's communications. So anyway, you got the L&N Railroad to Nashville, the Nashville and Chattanooga to the obvious places. You got the uh, Nashville and Northwestern Railroad from the Tennessee River to Nashville. And then you've got the Cumberland River. But in September, it's a dry season down there. And the Cumberland River, uh, the water over the Harpeth Shoals wouldn't allow boats to go up the river. So the main line of communication was actually from the Tennessee River at Johnsonville uh, to Nashville. So, there are two raids. Uh, Forrest first destroys the Tennessee and Alabama, the one that goes straight down here. That was being used by Sherman as a return line. In other words, the, the supplies were coming on the trains down the Nashville and Chattanooga, and then the empty trains were coming back up the other way, so you could have more throughput of supplies that way. But he'd already taken Atlanta, so it wasn't that big a deal anymore. Uh, Forrest was able to destroy that railroad. 
which redounded, unfortunately, for the Confederacy when he did that, but no way, nobody knew that yet. All right, so he came back from that raid. He couldn't get to Nashville and Chattanooga because Sherman had di dispatched several divisions north of, in of infantry north to outpost the entire railroad. He came back, and he got the order to go after Johnsonville. So he went back up there, managed to burn the depot, uh, sink several of the barges and several gunboats. All right, by this time, force men are about used up. But it, when he's up there, he gets an order. Join Hood in Middle Tennessee. Well, he can't. The Tennessee River has been rains for the last several days, and the Tennessee River is now flooding, so he has to go all the way back down into Mississippi. So he finally joins Hood in Florence, Alabama, and they go north on the rather disastrous Nashville campaign. Uh, Forrest manages to push Wilson, who is the brand-new cavalry commander there, off the battlefield and sets conditions for Hood to be able to destroy Schofield's uh, uh, basically reinforced Army Corps, but Hood is unable to stop him at Spring Hill. That's a whole controversy all of its own there. Um, so then, after Schofield gets by, he's, he's now in, uh, in Franklin, but he's got to repair the bridge across the Harpeth River, and so he sits there while his engineers are rebuilding the bridge, and Forrest recons, Hood comes up, and he's overlooking, and Forrest says, give me an infantry, a good infantry division, and I'll have them out there in a couple, out of there in a couple hours, because he could bypass the east. Hood, by this time, was mad at everybody, and uh, I think he felt like that Schofield wasn't serious about defending Franklin. He didn't realize the bridge problem, so he ordered the rather disastrous attack, Franklin, uh, which was not a success. And Forrest could not break through either without that infantry division because uh, Wilson had reinforced and he now outnumbered Forrest five to three. And Wilson had Spencing and Repeaters and was on the north side of the river. So that, that just didn't work all the way around. But at any rate, Schofield now retreats again with Wilson into the fortifications of Nashville. Forrest is sent over to Murfreesboro to try to take it, but there's 8,000 federal soldiers and 60 cannon in Fortress Rosecrans there, so that doesn't work out. All right, uh, the, uh, Thomas defeats Hood. The army virtually disintegrates. S.D. Lee's Corps is the only one that, that uh, holds together, and that's because it wasn't sacrificed on the field at Franklin. Uh, and they're streaming south through Columbia, Tennessee, uh, Forrest leaves Murfreesboro, comes over and joins in Columbia and is given charge of the rear guard. And they, the rear guard, manages to hold off Wood's Fourth Corps and Wilson's cavalry and keeps them away from the disorganized mass of Hood's army. And Hood is able to get his people all the way down into Alabama and across the Tennessee River there. So uh, that, act that performance of saving the Army of Tennessee is what uh, got Forrest promoted to Lieutenant General. Well, anyway, uh, after that, everybody went into winter quarters. But uh, Forrest was given now 10,000 cavalry. He had all the cavalry, Mississippi, Alabama, and eastern Louisiana. But he was faced by almost 200,000 Union soldiers surrounding the enclave that, that the Confederacy was holding in the center there. And he had 10,000 of his cavalry, and there were 10,000 infantry and, and artillery holding uh, Mobile, and that was all the Confederate forces that were available. So uh, what happens is he has to disperse his people to cover all the avenues, and also because the Confederacy could no longer feed an army of 10,000 cavalry in one place, so he had to disperse them so his people, this is wintertime, so he could feed his people. So when Wilson starts moving south in late March of 1865, Fort only able to bring 2,500 people of, of his people against the 13,500 cavalry that Wilson had, 
and uh, Wilson also got a little lucky. He intercepted a copy of Forrest's orders to his subordinates, so he knew where Forrest was and what he was planning. And he got an engineer, he captured an engineer, who would help build the fortifications of Selma. So he knew a lot more about Selma than Forrest did, who didn't arrive until the morning of April the 2nd. And Wilson attacked that night, very successful attack, although uh, at first they attacked where Forrest troops actually were, and that, that one was actually repulsed. But then they hit the militia, and it was all over. Forrest was able to escape with most of his people, but uh, Richard Taylor, who was now his boss of that whole area, surrendered the whole in May of 1865. So that was his war. So I say he made a difference in four times, stopping Buell from taking Chattanooga, possibly delaying the war for, or extending the duration of the war for a year, instrumental in stopping Grant's first attempt at Vicksburg, saving the Black Belt, the Mississippi Prairie, Selma, and Mobile for up to a year, and then, of course, Fort Pillow with all the negative things that happened because of Fort Pillow. So my feeling is he certainly made a difference in the big war, not just in the little wars that were all going around. Now, that's my conclusion. And, of course, now comes the obligatory shilling of the book. Uh, <coughs> the book is actually just covers exactly what I did. Don't even go into the biography before the war. Um, 466 pages, 109 maps. I have order of battle information, driving directions. Um, I got it for 25, but I'll, I'm making you guys a deal, $20. Uh, that's one page of the book. That happens to be uh, the uh, Paris landing right below Johnsonville there. It shows where the batteries were, where they captured one of the, uh, the ten clads and, and several of the cargo ships. And on the uh, part of it, you can see the text is somewhat shaded. When it's got a shaded background, those are the physically the driving directions, okay? And I do have some of the books over there for sale. So there will be $20, $20, and I'll be glad to, uh, to autograph them. And let's see if I still have that in there. Oh, yeah. Well, if, if you just want to order it, they're from Savas Beatty. Uh, you can also get them on Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble. Um, or you can e email me if, if you don't happen to have any money with you tonight. And I'm at scalesjr at aol.com. You get a simple email when you're an old guy like me. And uh, let's see. All right, I, I have four books. Will, will appear up there on Amazon. The latest one actually is something totally different, and I didn't even tell you guys about this. This is, I gotta show it. This is a fiction book. He said I was in Special Forces. I was in Special Forces for many, many years. So this is fiction set in the near future called In Service of the Nation. And it's about a Special Forces aid detachment on a training mission that gets involved in, uh, in a loose nuke, one stolen from Chinese stores by, uh, uh, by organized crime and terrorists, and they all get involved in that. Uh, action bounces around among spies, the Pentagon, and what's happening on the ground. It is not yet, well, it's actually available on, uh, on Amazon in the Kindle version, and uh, the hardbacks will be available, or paperbacks, rather, will be available in a couple of weeks. And then, of course, the main one that I have here is the forest book. All right, now, that's all I got. So what are your questions? All right, the question is, why so, so successful? Well, I can speak in military terms. There, there are several reasons. Uh, to use his terminology, 
give him a dare, and put the skier on. What that translates to is initiative. He took the initiative on every battlefield, even if he knew he was outnumbered. What that did was put people back on their heels. Psychological. Whenever he was in contact, he, even if he only had his own escort to send anywhere, he would send them around to the rear of the enemy. Now, what does a, what does a uh, military formation think when the enemy gets in your rear? Well, you've got to worry about it. Your retreat is being cut off. And plus, there's another piece to that, too. Say, I've got such a dumb commander, he's letting them get surround us, you know? So it, it destroys the confidence of, of the other side. Uh, he had personal leadership. I told you he was a very, very large, formidable person. And he fought hand-to-hand -hand combat many times. At the end of the war, he said that he had killed uh, 30 Union soldiers and lost 29 horses under him. And, of course, being the type of guy he was, he made the quip. I was a horse ahead at the time. Uh, let's see. He, he had scout companies that he used very, uh, very well. He understood the theater level as well as his local area. He had the ability, the, the French call the coup d'oeil. He could look at a battlefield and the surrounding area and almost instinctively could understand the possibilities and dangers there. And he understood logistics. That's funny, isn't it? He had almost no, no education. But remember, he had been a horse trader and a slave trader all over that country. He knew the countryside, but he also knew the capabilities of the horses, how much food they needed, how much rest they needed, et cetera, et cetera, and how much he needed for his people. So he had all these, plus, he, well, I mean, uh, you've got to listen to Lincoln, I mean, to, uh, to Sherman. What did Sherman say about him after the war? He said that Forrest was the most remarkable man that emerged on either side during the war because he was brilliant even though uneducated. Uh, a very interesting person. If you want to know his personality, or more about his personality rather than the military part, Brian Steele Will's biography is probably for uh, understanding his personality. Yes, sir. All right, the, the story is that he took 45 slaves with him. He said after the war that uh, 44 of them stuck with him. He lost one um, at, uh, actually at the tail end of that first, when he got kind of surprised by some of Thomas's people. And one of his, one of his uh, slaves was driving uh, a wagon, and, and Thomas's guys actually captured the wagon and, and the man. But he, he, he made the comment after the war that better Confederates never lived. Now, yes, he did. He was the kind of person that inspired personal loyalty, even among people, the, the slaves that you would think had no loyalty. Is it, you know, very interesting. I don't think he was, probably wasn't a whole lot of fun to work for, but, you know, because he was very demanding, but uh, very capable. Uh, there's, there's word, I, I should mention one thing, and I don't know how true this is. I know that his scout company actually had a couple of his slaves that were useful to go behind Union lines. I, the story says that a couple of people in his escort were actually his slaves and were armed uh, and, and personally guarded him at night, but that's a story that, you know, is that true? I don't know. Other questions? Okay. How would you say history appears of force in the context of Reconstruction? Okay, well, re obviously that's not something I covered in the book. I, I tried to concentrate on the military matters. Uh, it's, it's hard to say. Right now, 
uh, if, if you look in many places, they'll say, well, he founded the KKK. Now, that's a falsehood. Uh, uh, the KKK was founded in Pulaski, Tennessee in December of 1865. When I was a kid, there was a, there was a plaque on the wall that named who was there and when it occurred. The plaque's still there, but it's turned in where you can't read it anymore. Uh, he probably was a member, and he probably was a senior advisor. The KKK was actually very uh, distributed. They, the, there, there wasn't much of a central hierarchy that actually occurred, which was one of the problems, of course. Uh, the person that the people who have delved into it say was the, the actual head man was a Brigadier General George Gordon of Tennessee. Uh, and that's the one that many people say, well, you know, that's who was really running it day to day. You know, after the war, uh, Forrest had lost almost all his fortune. And in fact, he was floundering financially. He tried to sell insurance. That didn't work because nobody had any money in the South. He tried to build the Selma to Memphis Railroad and got involved in the railroad from Memphis across the river into Arkansas. That's why Forest City uh, it has its name. But those all failed because of uh, financial panics. And he underwent personal bankruptcy in 1868. Okay. Um, so he was very busy actually trying to keep his head above water. In fact, had to live with, uh, with his brother for a while. And then um, he started getting sick. And he, in 1875, he was invited to address the pole bearers. I don't know if you know what that is, but it's, it's a uh, forerunners of the, K, uh, of the uh, NAACP. Uh, it was an all-black organization in Memphis, and he was actually invited to address them. And uh, it's interesting, if you read his, his sh very short address, uh, he, was, he was actually uh, cussed out by a lot of Southern newspapers. But he said, but he told them, I want you to be lawyers and doctors and vote for who you want. You know, you have the same rights as I do. We're both free men now. And that's, uh, that was his address to, to, to that group. So I, I think he was trying to, do some reconciliation because it had been very bad in Tennessee. Uh, Parson Brownlow, the Reconstruction governor, had basically declared open season on any old Confederate veterans. And that had caused a lot of animosity. And they had, the, the Republican Party had financed some uh, black organizations to be armed. And there was, that's part of all the KKK. It was called the Loyal Leagues is what that was called. And there were, it was a big mess. And the racial relations were actually perceived by many people to be worse then than they had been uh, before. And I think that was his attempt at reconciliation at that time. And then shortly after that, probably six months later, uh, he had never been religious at all, although his wife was devout uh, Presbyterian. And he accepted uh, the Presbyterian faith and two years after that, he died. Uh, he, the, the thought is that he died of uh, adult onset diabetes. Any other questions? I have, on a typical battle, any one of these uh, smaller engagements where you have 500, 1,500, 2,500 men, were they nearly all cavalry? I mean, how many? Yeah. Uh, the only time, the only times that he actually had dismounted infantry, or the only time really was in the retreat from Nashville. Uh, he had his cavalry, slightly less than 3,000 men, and 2,300 effective, effective infantry under Walthall. And I say effective, half of them were barefoot and it was snowing. But, uh, that, that's the really, and in uh, Murfreesboro, right before that, he had been reinforced by Bates Division with 1,300 people. If 
you can imagine a, a division with 1,300 people. Uh, so those, those are the only times, and I was very unsuccessful, by the way, but uh, it, the retreat from Nashville, he was very successful. So those are the only times he actually commanded infantry. He fought his cavalry as dragoons, though. Horses were a means of movement, not of fighting, except if the enemy was retreating. If the enemy was retreating, he'd stay, you know, mounted and, and, and get amongst them. But as far as fighting, he would dismount. And in fact, that's one of the reasons Bryce's Crossroads succeeded, was he had been augmented by uh, mounted infantry from Kentucky, Lyons Brigade. And uh, they were the first ones to make contact with Grierson. And uh, so they still had long-range infields, whereas Grierson's guys all had carbines. And so they recoiled, even though they outnumbered Lyon's brigade fairly severely, they recoiled because they were fighting, they thought they were fighting an, an entire infantry unit. And uh, that caused them to retreat and kind of get into a tight perimeter, which then, when Forrest Artillery arrived, he was able to pound that perimeter. And that is one of the main reasons uh, that uh, Sturgis lost Bryce's Crossroads. So interesting stuff, but mostly, as I say, mostly he was employed as dragoons. Otherwise, sir. No, I haven't heard that. Uh, of course, the U.S. Colored Troops, they only uh, enlisted 18, 180,000 uh, was, was their total strength. Um, but, yeah, it was bad for both blacks and whites in the South because, uh, you know, the, they didn't take a lot of the property away from the white landowners. And contrary to popular belief, many people owned land. It wasn't just a few big plantations. But so they didn't, the, the blacks who fled their plantation had nothing to do. They weren't wanted up north. When blacks were sent, uh, they were sent back down because, uh, I mean, I hate to say it, but the entire United States was very racist at that time. It wasn't just the South. Uh, you, you can read any of the, the, of the speeches of the people of that time and uh, I mean, it is terrible things. Uh, in fact, there's a, a general who was trying to send uh, contrabands, is what they were called, north from Mississippi, and he wrote to uh, the War Department and said, this will not do. They keep sending them back every time I send them up there to find a place uh, to, that can take care of them. Uh, so it, it's, I don't know about the million, there were probably, there were slightly less than five million blacks in the entire South at the, at the census of, of 1860. So, you know, how many of them were adult males? Probably 1.5 million, something like that. I don't, but I don't know for sure. I'm not an expert in that area. Yeah, he said he lost one. Yes, yes. There's, some of them went back with him. And remember, but you've got to remember, too, I've got to give you the other side. They probably had families down there, you know? And, and, and they knew that land, and they knew they could trust him because he'd taken care of them during the war. And in fact, uh, what he tried to do was when he first got back was to make a crop he hired seven union officers and 200 former slaves to work those two plantations he had down there but it overall turned out to be unsuccessful for for several reasons and he uh when he when he went bankrupt he lost all of his property down there 
Okay, I, I better let you guys <laughs> get out of here. Well, John, I would like to present you with our certificate of honor by the order of the general staff of the Civil War Roundtable of <laughs> Milwaukee. This award is, is presented to John R. Scales for furthering our understanding of the causes and consequences of the American Civil War, the watershed event in our nation's history. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate thank it. Oh, I won't. Yeah, I'll, I'll have the books for sale for those that want it. That's, a, that's all right. We're not done yet. It's been a while since I've got to do this because we've had a lot of repeat customers and my speakers. Um, in the years after the Civil War, the veterans of the Iron Brigade, Wisconsin, Michigan, Indiana regiments, had formed an association uh, to honor their service. In uh, the 1880s, they had a children in that membership. In 1992, surviving sons of Union veterans turned over the care of the Iron Brigade Association to the Civil War Roundtable of Milwaukee um, as a carrying on of that tradition. It is my pleasure to present membership in the Iron Brigade Association. Wow, Should thank you very much. I appreciate it. That's great. Didn't expect that at all. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, all right. Well, thank